Hello students, welcome to the fourth lecture of the online course on nanophotonics plus bionics and metamaterials. In this lecture, we will look into the electromagnetic theory of light. So here is the lecture outline. We'll have a brief overview of the electromagnetic optics and then we'll look into divergence, curl and gradient operations, Gauss theorem and Stokes theorem, the constitutive relations. Then we'll look into Maxwell's equation, the overview, then Gauss law for electric field, Gauss law for magnetic fields, Faraday's law, Ampere Maxwell's equation, and then if time permits, we'll look into wave equation and boundary conditions. So that's the picture of the great man, James Clark Maxwell, who actually did this wonderful work on advancing the theory of light and proved that light is an electromagnetic wave phenomena. He formulated a set of fundamental equations of enormous importance and that is why they belong to his credit. Because using these equations, as you can see, these equations are basically done by Gauss, Faraday and Ampere. But then the set of these four equations are able to describe the electromagnetic property of light. And that is why he is the one to combine these equations to describe the electromagnetic property of light and that, that's why these equations bear his name. Now let's look into the electromagnetics, electromagnetic optics. Okay, So wave optics has a far greater reach okay, than the ray optics. Remarkably, uh, both approaches can provide similar results for many simple optical phenomena involving paraxial waves such as you know focusing of light by lens and behavior of light in gradient index material and periodic medium okay but wave optics offers something that you know ray optics cannot something like you know wave optics has the ability to explain phenomena such as interference and diffraction which using ray optics you cannot however ray optics sometimes also face difficulty in explaining uh, the beam splitting okay some that is like the division of light using a beam splitter so these are different areas which are all part of electromagnetic optics but then wave optics can explain certain phenomena ray optics are able to explain certain phenomena and they are not good at certain different aspects so these are overall picture of where electromagnetic optics wave optics and ray optics are lying so you can actually see that you know <coughs> you can say electromagnetic optic is basically a vector theory that comprises both electric field and magnetic field that varies with time and space. If you look into wave optics which is basically a subdomain of electromagnetic optics there you can say that it's an approximation of the electromagnetic optics that relies on wave function. That's why we call it as wave optics. And you can describe it at a, as a um, scalar function of both time and space. Then let's look into ray optics, which is again another limit of the wave optics, where the wavelength is very short. In short, you can say that electromagnetic optics encompasses the wave optics, which in turn reduces to ray optics in the limit of short wavelengths. Okay. So there are situations where light has to be treated as vector, then there are situations or limits in which light can be easily treated as a scalar function, okay, or they can be in the short wavelength range, they can be described as rays. So why we need all these different approximation to try to explain different optical phenomena. So that is how you can actually get a broader picture of what do you mean by electromagnetic optics, wave optics and ray optics. Now this particular electromagnetic spectrum we have already discussed in our first module but still I am just putting it here just to give you a recap that when we say optics okay we do not actually mean only the visible. We are actually discussing you know wavelength starting from ultraviolet to IR. So this is the optical wavelength range that we talk about so starting from say 10 nanometer to several uh, millimeter 
not millimeter like a uh, fraction of millimeter so that will correspond to the infrared boundary okay so you can say um, several micrometer thousand hundreds of micrometers so this is the range over which the optical range is spread and you can look into the bar here and you can see the frequency range over which this optical window is spread so in common with the radio waves and the x-ray waves so here you have radio and microwave waves on the other side you have x-ray waves so electromagnetic phenomena here the optical range can be described using a vector wave theory okay yeah here is the exact number 300 micrometer so if we say uh, optical range it basically extends from as i mentioned 10 nanometer to 300 micrometer so that is the range we are discussing electromagnetic radiation propagates in the form of two mutually coupled vectors so one is electric field vector another is magnetic field vector okay so that is why we say light is an electromagnetic wave now before we go into understanding you know maxwell's equation for electromagnetics there are some basic uh, theories or concepts in vector calculus that we need to uh, revise so here i'll quickly give you an overview of this um, operators which are very very popularly used in vector calculus so these are gradient divergence and curl so what is gradient it is basically a change in magnitude of scalar field so gradient is basically the change divergence tells you the source of the vector field and curl is associated with the rotation of the vector field so you can see from the diagram here that if there is positive charge here and then the positive charge is increasing in this region so there is a gradient in this particular direction similarly in case of negative charge you can say if there are more negative charge here and less here so this is how the gradient is okay so always remember that the gradient of a scalar field is actually a vector so the gradient that you are computing is of a scalar field okay but the gradient itself becomes a vector because it will have the rate of change okay with the space okay and then it will also have a direction associated divergence as i mentioned is basically you know tells you about the source of the vector field so here you can see positive divergence here you can see negative divergence okay and the divergence of a vector field is basically a scalar and this is curl curl is associated with the rotation of the vector field so as you know that rotation can be either in counterclockwise or it can be in clockwise direction so you can use your right hand thumb rule so if it if the curl is in this direction in the direction of your fingers your thumb actually point the curl okay so the rotation of the vector field is in the direction of the fingers the thumb gives you the similarly here the rotation is in this direction so the thumb gives you the curl which is basically into the screen okay in this case so the basic operations that allow extracting this information about the distribution of uh, electromagnetic field then energy associated with the field and electromagnetic radiation and so on so these basic operators like gradient divergence and curl can give you a lot of information out of the electromagnetic waves and the four maxwell's equation on which you can say the electromagnetism is completely dependent on they are actually using all these uh, vector calculus notations okay so one such important operator is called nabla okay or you can also call it del as you'll see so in 3d space okay the vectors can be split into its orthogonal components so any vector will have its x y z components if we take cartesian coordinate system so in this particular lecture we'll only focus on the cartesian coordinate system as you know there are other uh, coordinate systems as well like spherical cylindrical and there the the equations for curl gradient divergence all these things will be different depending on the coordinate system you are choosing so let us only focus here uh, on the 
Cartesian coordinate system. If required, we'll go to the other coordinate systems depending on the applications we'll be discussing. So the vectors can be split into the orthogonal components and the partial derivatives can be calculated accordingly for each directional component. So the del operator is basically a vector differential operator. So here are the different notations that you can use for this del operator and it is basically ddx or dot o x you can say in i cap dot o y y cap and dot o z or dot o z in k cap okay similar to the nabla operator or del operator you can also have another operator called laplacian which is also based on nabla it is basically nabla square so laplacian is also sometimes called nabla squared or del squared operator so that is basically does what double differentiation so th they can be represented as you know so you have del dot del or you can use them in bold face so instead of using the vector arrows here you can actually look for bold face the same thing shown here or you can simply write them as you know as these are like implied that this is basically a vector Similarly, the squared form also can be written in each, any of this form, that is fine. And they actually give you dot o x square plus dot o y square, or you can say d square dz square, okay, whichever way you call it, okay, call it. So this is basically what? This is basically second order differentiation. So now let's, let's look into a little bit of more details into the gradient divergence and curl. So as I mentioned that uh, a scalar fields gradient is again a vector field reason is um, here there are two components one is the magnitude the magnitude actually tells you about the rate of change of that uh, scalar field and then there is a direction along which you know it is changing so that is why gradient of a scalar field becomes a vector so here are the two examples we have already seen so I'm not discussing them again now if um, Delta is made to operate on a scalar field as you understand you will get a vector and this is given by this particular notation so you can write gradient of f or you can write grad of f or you can simply write you know del f okay that will give you gradient so same different variation in you can write del with a small arrow on top that is the you know del operator okay or you can write this way or you can write this way all this actually come with the same meaning so how do you call it how do you read it it is called grad f okay gradient of f okay so you are basically taking help of the nabla operator for writing this so when you do this gradient of f how it works you have this del operator which can be written in this so as you have seen in the previous uh, slide this one the del operator can be written as this so we just took it here and then f f is what f is a scalar field so you can simply apply the differentiation okay and you will get this one okay so the gradient may be in x or y or in all three okay depending on that this partial derivatives will be computed and you will get the gradient of f okay now let us look into the other operator which is basically divergence now divergence quantifies the magnitude there is no direction associated so in that case you understood that if you take divergence of a vector field you will basically get a scalar field that is why it is written divergence of a vector field gives you a scalar field so it tells you the amount of a vector field which flows out or into a specific region so in other words you can say that the divergence calculate the amount of source or sink for a given field okay so you can actually identify the source or sink from the divergence if there is no source or sink what will happen the divergence will be zero now what is the source of electric charge positive electric field is a positive charge okay so if you look into this particular diagram if you say there is a positive charge so the electric field lines are actually coming out of it so the electric field lines are originating from that particular source so this is called a positive divergence on the other hand if you see that what is the sink of electric 
field lines that will be the negative charges right if just recollect your school uh, physics you will see that the electric line electric field lines are basically originating from the positive charge and they are coming back and entering the negative charge right so here you can see that you know if you have a standalone uh, negative charge you will see the electric field lines will come into and converge into that particular negative charge so this particular phenomena is nothing but negative divergence so how do you actually write this thing so as i mentioned once again let me tell you that when you take the del operator okay or the nabla operator and you operate your vector field so this time f is a vector field so that is why f is shown as bold okay so it's a vector field and you want to calculate the divergence and we know that the divergence of this vector field will be a scalar okay so how do you notify it or what are the notifications you can simply write divergence of f vector okay or you can write it in short form div f vector or you can write del dot f so again del can be given as this nabla operator with a you know vector arrow marking or you can use the bold face or you can simply write this dot f as you see f is always maintained in bold face because otherwise you have to write this with the arrow to tell that this is basically a vector field and when you have this uh, vector field okay this vector field will have its component along x y and z and that you can also write delta in terms of uh, dot o x i cap dot o y y cap and dot o c k cap okay and then you can multiply the corresponding you know vectors and you will find this is what you get so this basically is basically the scalar field and that is how we have come to this conclusion that when you compute the divergence of a vector field it comes out to be a scalar so this is the scalar quantity clear so now let's move on to the third operator which is curl operator the calculation of curl quantifies the amount and the direction of rotation of a vector field now whenever you will see there is a rotation of electric field or magnetic field there is a curl associated with it so how do you quantify this curl and what is the direction of this curl okay so curl can be actually uh, represented as i mentioned before so I, either the rotation is in uh, counterclockwise or it is in clockwise direction so accordingly the curl will also have this direction upwards or downwards right so curl is the result being a vector so again it's a vector perpendicular to the plane of rotation so this is the plane of rotation this particular computer screen is the plane of rotation in which the vector fields are rotating okay so in this case the curl will have the direction either out of it or into it so how do you calculate curl in a uh, 3d cartesian system so you can write the note not notation can be curl curl of the vector f okay so curl is always calculated of a vector field so the notation is this nabla operator with a vector sign so this is the or you can say del cross f vector okay or you can write it this way okay and then when you take the cross product of the two vectors this is how the field can be computed okay so it will be do fz do y minus do fy do z this will be the component along i cap then do fx do z minus do fz do x will be the component along y direction or you can say it is j cap so, and do fy do x minus do fx do y that will be the quantity along z direction or k cap unit vector so this is how you can compute divergence curl and gradient of any field okay now there are two important theorems that will also be very much useful so let us quickly cover those theorems because these are related to this vector fields and they will be important in understanding the maxwell's equation so one such theorem is called gauss theorem or uh, divergence theorem uh, 
Now, what does this theorem states? You look into the picture here. So, this theorem states that the flux of a vector quantity at outward through a closed surface S is equal to the integral of the divergence of the function that is enclosed in the enclosed volume V. So, if you take the flux, okay, this is the flux in a closed surface. So, closed surface are shown using, you know, this kind of uh, circles on the integration. So, you are actually doing a surface integral here and that is equivalent to the divergence of the function. So, you are calculating the divergence of the function in a enclosed volume V, okay, that actually covers this particular closed surface. So, here you can see this is the closed surface and this is the particular volume V, okay. So, in this equation, the V denotes the volume, F denotes the analyzed vector field, S is basically the surface that is covering the entire volume. So, that is S and uh, A cap is nothing but the you know normal vector <coughs> or this is the unit normal vector. So, from this theorem what do we understand? That if the volume, if this particular volume does not contain a source or a sink, okay, it means the net flux through that particular volume must be zero. That means there is no flux originating or uh, terminating at a particular place inside this volume. So, all the flux that is entering this volume must also leave this volume. Okay. So, it is possible to find such volume that will entrap an electric charge because each electric charge represents an electric monopole. So, you can actually have uh, monopoles in electric charges whereas if you try to find monopoles in magnetic charge that is not possible. Okay, we will come to that later on but this is the main um, understanding of Gauss theorem that if you want to take the surface integral over a closed surface okay, for a particular vector field that is equal to the divergence of that function. Okay, in a volume made out of this you know surface closed surfaces fine now it is not possible to find a volume that entraps a magnetic charge okay that is why the magnetic field is divergence less so if you take f as a magnetic field okay you will see that the divergence of the magnetic field is basically zero because you are not able to find any on one particular uh, pole separated out okay so there is no magnetic monopole and that is why the divergence of magnetic field lines okay is always zero fine so the first one that you have discussed here will lead to the first maxwell's equation and this one that magnetic monopoles does not exist that will give rise to the second maxwell's equation so, this was one important theorem called Gauss theorem or divergence theorem. The second important theorem is the Stokes theorem. Now, as you can see in the picture here, okay, the Stokes theorem actually states that the surface integral of the curl of the vector field F over an open surface. So, let us assume this is an open surface and there are many curl of the vector field. So, if you compute the overall curl of this uh, vector field in this open surface that will be equal to the closed line integral of the vector along the contour that is enclosing this open surface. So, this was the open surface and if you take this particular line that is uh, you know the, the, that is basically along the contour which is enclosing the open surface. So, the line integral of the vector so, the line integral of the vector along this contour, okay, that will be same as all the curls that are actually there in this open surface, okay. So, if you take the curl and you sum up all the curls or you integrate all the curls, okay, over this particular um, open surface S, 
that is equivalent to this one so it's very nicely shown pictorially you can understand the sum of all the curves is basically sum of this you know line integral and what is da da is nothing but you no know, this is the unit vector that is normal to the surface so in other words you can say that the circulation of a vector around a given boundary is equal to the net curl over the whole surface of the patch limited by that boundary. So with that we understood the basic theorem and the basic operators that will be needed for dealing with uh, Maxwell's equation. Now let us try to understand the constitutive relations and before we do that okay we have to understand that Maxwell's equation okay talks about the electric field and magnetic field and when there will be this electric field magnetic field interacting with matter the permittivity and permeability these two factors will come into the picture now the, what are these pictures these terms permittivity and permeability you have you must have studied in your school days these are basically the um, <coughs> measure of how electromagnetic field or how a matter actually interacts with electric field and magnetic field okay so that is we'll go into each of this so let's look into the first one which is the dielectric permittivity okay so dielectric permittivity is basically a diagnostic uh, physical property which characterizes the degree of electric polarization a material can experience when it is subjected to some external electric field so permittivity is related to external electric field so how do you define the dielectric permittivity it's it's defined as a ratio between the electric field within a material and the corresponding electric displacement okay so we'll explain this with using this particular diagram so when there is uh, no electric field okay all these are basically unpolarized atomic elements you can see the elect atoms with their electrons and all these things the displacement is zero polarization is zero because there is no applied electric field as soon as there is an electric field applied to this material okay you will see that the electron cloud is trying to you know repel this electric field and they move out from the nucleus so what happens you know there is a slight space region with more electrons and there is a region where there is a deficiency of electron that can be denoted as minus and plus deficiency of electrons means you can mark that as positive so this is how you know the polarization of each atomic element takes place so each of these will get polarized okay and because of that you can write down that the polarization okay is proportional to the applied electric field and if you try to find out what is the value of that polarization that we will see using the permittivity so first of all the definition is clear that you know dielectric permittivity is basically the ratio of electric field so it is d equals epsilon naught e so what is epsilon naught it is basically d over e so it is the displacement field over the electric field that gives you epsilon naught which is vacuum permittivity okay so the value for vacuum permittivity is well known it's uh, 8.85 into 10 to the power minus 12 f by m what is f farad right so when we expose to the electric field we have seen that you know the bonded electrical charges of opposite sign they try to separate from each other and that results into you know the polarization of the material which is called electric polarization and you can write d in the presence of uh, a material it becomes epsilon not e plus p so this is the extra term that is coming when your electromagnetic field is interacting with the material okay and p can be written as epsilon minus epsilon naught times e what is epsilon that is the permittivity of the material epsilon naught is vacuum permittivity when you add this two up you get d is proportional to epsilon e in a particular matter on the other hand if you look for magnetic field so when exposed to an applied magnetic field 
the collection of individual magnetic uh, dipole moments within most material will attempt to reorient themselves in the direction of the applied field and this will generate some induced magnetism okay which uh, contributes towards the net magnetic flux density inside the material these are all known factors but still i am covering them quickly the degree in which the induced magnetism impact the magnetic flux density depends on the material's magnetic permeability so let us define permeability so permeability is basically the ratio between the magnetic flux density b within a material and the intensity of the applied magnetic field h okay and provided that both the fields are sufficiently weak so you can write that b the magnetic flux density is proportional to mu naught h what is mu naught is the permeability of free space and the value is 4 pi into 10 to the minus 7 henry per meter okay and then there is additional term which is mu naught m so this is the magnetization of that particular material we are talking about now in most cases we deal with non-magnetic material in the optical field so we can safely take uh, m equals 0 so that brings this equation to a simpler form that b is simply mu naught h the contribution from the material perspective for the magnetic field we are not considering most cases in the optical or nanophotonics domain okay because we deal with again non-magnetic material fine so let's look into the Maxwell's equation now so Maxwell's equation is nothing but it actually describes the electromagnetic field by the two related vector fields one is you know electric field another is magnetic field and this fields electric and magnetic fields are both function of r and t that is space and time now after the myriad of researchers carried out for fundamental reasons behind the source of electromagnetic field and the relations between electric and magnetic field by the pioneer scientists like Ampere, Coulomb, Faraday, Gauss, the revolution in the electromagnetic field could happen when uh, James Clerk Maxwell, he could propose this set of fundamental equations in 1865. So before that the individual laws of electric field and magnetic fields were existing but the field of electromagnetism came after the integration of these equations by Maxwell. So the Maxwell's equations are valid for both static and dynamic electromagnetic field in a media. So these are the Maxwell's equation. So divergence of E is nothing but rho V that is a charge density in a volume divided by epsilon. On the other hand, divergence of magnetic field is zero. Reason is that there is no magnetic monopole. If there is a monopole present, then only you can have a positive divergence or negative divergence, but then that is not there. So the divergence is zero. Carl of E. So the first two are called Gauss law. This is called Gauss law for magnetism. This one is Faraday's law, which is Carl of E is related to the time varying so if there is any time varying um, magnetic field that will have some circulating current so that is given by Carl of E okay so Carl of E is minus mu dou h by dot t that is called Faraday's law and we also have Ampere's law so this is basically the corrected Ampere's law or we can say this is based on Ampere's law so here we have Carl of H. So there is a magnetic field circulating, okay, which is basically dependent on the current density plus the change in the electric flux with time. Epsilon E is nothing but D, okay. So these are the terms that you have to keep in mind. So you have seen we are we are writing all of these in terms of e and h but we also know from the constitutive relationship that d equals epsilon e that means the electric flux density or the displacement field is basically epsilon e and the magnetic flux density that is b is mu naught h 
okay so here in this equation if you put mu and h together you basically get b so these equations become minus dou b dot d okay and this equation becomes d capital d or dou capital d dot t okay fine so maxwell's equation can be written in both integral form as well as uh, differential form so we'll only focus here on the integral form because of the you know it's easy to write and also um, it's easy to describe but they actually convey the same meaning these are just different form of writing the same equation so let's start with the first one that is uh, gauss law for electric field so it says that you know while the area integral of the electric field gives a measure of the net charge enclosed the divergence of the electric field gives a measure of the density of those sources okay so here you can see the divergence is giving you the charge density okay so from this also you can see the integral form so here you see the divergence sorry the displacement field integrated over a closed circuit a closed surface is basically giving with the charge that is enclosed okay you can also write it in terms of uh, the density charge density over volume this is v stands for volume charge density okay so you call it raw v okay and if you integrate it over the volume so you will get nothing but the charge okay so this one and this one then needs to be equated so this is volume integral this is surface integral so how do you actually change from surface integral to volume integral you can take the help of the theorems that you have studied so we'll come into that but let me quickly give you an overview of maxwell's equation so the second one is the gauss law of magnetism so it tells you that the net flux will be always zero for dipole sources in magnetic field the poles cannot be separated so they always remain as dipole and there you will see that the divergence of the magnetic flux density is zero okay faraday's law actually gives you that the line integral of the electric field around a closed loop is equal to the negative rate of change of the magnetic flux through the area enclosed by that loop so you can see it from here or you can also write it as the curl of e is nothing but minus dou b dot t and finally the fourth equation or the ampere maxwell equation it tells you that the total magnetic force around a circuit in terms of the current through the circuit plus any varying electric field through the circuit that is basically the displacement current so you can actually see it here that curl of h and these are all time varying and space dependent okay so curl of h is nothing but jt that is the uh, current flowing through the circuit plus there is something extra which is the electric field displacement okay over time or the rate of change of the displacement field that is basically the displacement current the time rate of change of any field is basically this one is current right so let's look into the first equation in more details so we can write divergence of d is nothing but rho f so this is also called as gauss law for electric so if we assume that there is a s that is the closed surface okay and the total charge in this region enclosed by this closed surface s is q you can write you know e dot n cap n cap is the unit vector normal to the surface okay when you do this surface integral you will get it as q over epsilon naught okay so the gauss law basically tells you that the flux that you are getting the you can say the flux of the electric field through s is basically the total charge enclosed by this closed surface s divided by the permittivity so this is the flux that is 
equal to the total charge divided by the permittivity now if you try to this is the integral form so if you try to you know convert this into the uh, differential form you can take help of the divergence theorem how to work with that so this equation is basically a surface integral okay so from surface integral you can use the divergence theorem and you can say the divergence of that particular field vector field over the volume will be same as this particular surface integral so now this is in terms of volume okay again the right hand side of this equation q by epsilon naught you can write it as volume integral of rho dv over epsilon naught now if you take these two together okay so here you can see you can actually find out that these are both volume integrals so the quantity this quantity and this quantity must be equal so that way you can obtain del dot e equals rho over epsilon naught simple so that way from every integral form equation you can actually use those theorem that you have studied and the vector identity so we can come to the differential forms similarly looking at the second gauss law for magnetic field so gauss law for magnetism says that no magnetic monopole exists and that is why the total flux through a closed surface must be zero so del dot b is zero and that can be derived from integration of b dot ds so if you take a closed surface okay with area s so this is the total flux okay through that closed surface and that is zero and this is happening because if you take a bar magnet and try to cut into two parts hoping that you will be able to separate north and south pole that doesn't work the small magnet also becomes it also have its own north and south pole so if you can if you break it infinitely small size also there also there will be two poles present so there is it is not possible to have any magnetic monopole the third one is called faraday's law okay so this is one of the first two uh, equations that connect e and b okay so e is a conservative field that you have to keep in mind in the absence of a magnetic field or you can say the magnetic field is constant in time so electromagnetic induction was first independently discovered by michael faraday in 1831 and then by joseph henry in 1832 and uh, faraday was the first to publish his uh, results of the experiment so these are known as you know faraday's law of electromagnetism so if you think of this particular equation which is known as faraday's law there you are we are able to connect e and b okay so what happens in this particular equation let's look into the you know integral form first so it says that the line integral of the electric field around a closed loop so this is how you can write it is equal to the negative rate of change of the magnetic flux through the area and closed by that particular loop so if you take this is the you know magnetic flux and this is the negative rate of change of the magnetic flux through that particular loop so here is a picture snapshot that also shows you the same thing so if you have a magnet and this is a loop that is measuring the amount of you know field lines going into it so when you move it towards okay there is a rate of change in the magnetic flux lines or magnetic field lines so that will uh, rotate the needle of the galvanometer to one direction and if you take it away from this particular loop it is recorded in the galvanometer in the opposite direction okay so this actually tells you the law of magnetic induction electromagnetic induction so let's see how do we get you know this particular differential form equation from the integral form 
So what was there in the integral form? It's a closed loop integral, line integral, you can say e dot dl. Okay, so let's write e dot dl. So if you use e dot dl, you can also write it in terms of surface integral by taking the curl of that particular field. And that is what we learned from the Stokes theorem. And when you write this, so it becomes curl of e dot ds, okay? And you are integrating over the surface now. So this is same as the right hand side here, which is already having a surface integral. So you can now compare the quantity inside the integral and you can write that this side curl of E is equal to minus dou B dot T. So this is how we are able to get this differential form. Okay. So the physical meaning is very simple that a changing magnetic field will introduce circulating electric field. Okay. So changing electric field means it is changing with time. Okay. So a time varying magnetic field will introduce a curl of E means circulating current. Curl means the electric field going this way. So there is a circulating current. So this is Faraday's law. The next one, let's look into the fourth Maxwell's equation that is coming from the Ampere's law. So Ampere's law does not have any time dependence. So it simply says that if you have a um, conductor carrying current I, okay. So when the conductor is carrying current I, it will produce a magnetic field that will circle the wire, okay. So again, you can take it this way. So I is the you know, right hand thumb rule, it follows. So if thumb points to the direction of current flow, the fingers they will point the direction of the magnetic field okay so ampere had shown how to make magnetism from electricity so that is actually a big big um, discovery because you are able to get magnetic fields or magnetism by current flow okay now if you try to look this same thing in the integral form it is written in terms of you know the bayer sabert law so from Bayard savart law, we know that you now the magnetic field due to a long um, straight wire can be written as B equals mu naught I 2 pi R. Okay. So I is the current, mu naught is the vacuum permeability and 2 pi R is basically the, you know, R is the radius of this particular rod. Then because B and DL both are in the same direction you can take their dot product and that comes out to be also BDL okay so when you take the line integral okay so how do you get this the line integral of this small element DL along this circumference you will get 2 pi r okay so finally you can write Okay, I'm just skipping the steps and finally you can write that the line integral of B is nothing but mu naught I. Okay, so it means the amount of uh, magnetic field that is being generated okay, is proportional to the current that is flowing in the wire. So you can also put this particular um, relation that you have learned that B equals mu naught H in the integral form of the Ampere's law and that will also help us to get the differential form of this Maxwell's equation, the fourth one. So you can write, you know, in this equation, if you write B equals mu naught H, you get mu naught H DL equals mu naught I. So mu naught you can cancel out from both sides. You can simply write that the line integral of H is nothing but of nothing but the current enclosed or simply i okay and i can also be written as what is j that is the current density so density times the area that will give you the current okay so i can be written as h dot dl 
and h can be written it can be converted into the surface integral by taking the curl of it so this equation can be now equated to this surface integral so here also you have surface integral here also you have surface integral you can equate these two quantities and you can write curl of h is nothing but j that means when you have a current density you are actually or current flowing you are actually getting a magnetic field lines around it but then this is an incomplete equation and it is not valid for electrodynamics it is good for electrostatics but not for electrodynamics so this is where you know the only this form is called the ampere's law but then why did ampere law went wrong and you know how it became incomplete the first thing was that it didn't have any time dependence so maxwell brought in time dependence in uh, this particular uh, equation and that was the biggest contribution of maxwell so maxwell wrote down the ampere's law and he actually found out that it is incomplete because when you take the divergence of the uh, ampere's law so ampere's law is curl of h equals j so if you take the divergence of this two so you are taking divergence on both side so you are getting this equation on the left now divergence of a curl is zero okay that we all know so it means divergence of this j is becoming always zero so that is that the case all the time but that is not the case all the time because electric currents they obey the continuity equation okay it means if there is some change in the you know charge density rho okay they that will also affect your current density okay so you can also relate it like dot d dot t is nothing but minus divergence of j so mathematically you can say that the curl of h is not only just this particular quantity j plus it has got some extra thing okay and that is some time dependent thing so maxwell knew that a time varying magnetic field can give rise to solenoidal current that he has seen from the faraday's law then he thought that why not you know a time varying d field can give rise to a solenoidal h field so this is actually the beauty of nature because nature loves symmetry and that is how you know maxwell was able to introduce this new term called displacement current density which he named as jd so dot d by dot t is the rate of change in electric flux density and that is given as di displacement charge density so when you add that term to this current density this equation is complete then in that case it will be able to explain all the phenomena in the electrostatics as well as electrodynamics okay so this is the ampere maxwell equation in the complete form that a current a flowing current that is j give rise to a magnetic field that circles the current that is fine that is the pure ampere's law and then you also have a time changing electric flux density d that also gives rise to a magnetic field that will circle the d field okay so this is basically the maxwell's contribution so you can write curl of h equals j plus jd where jd is nothing but do d dot t okay or you can simply write this one so here is a complete summary of maxwell's equation so as you can see here on this particular column shows electrostatics or electromagnetics and the, here it is time varying so it is the dynamic one so in electrostatics and electromagnetics we assume electric and magnetic fields are independent of each other and in the time varying or the dynamic theory we assume that they are coupled to each other maxwell's equation these are all given in the integral form so in electrostatics you have seen this very well that the surface integral of the electric flux density is basically giving you the enclosed charge 
and that remains same even in the time varying nature also similarly when you see that the electric field line integral okay is zero but in the time doming or time varying nature you will see that can be related to the rate of change in the magnetic flux density similarly the third equation that remains unchanged that you have already discussed but the fourth equation again okay the magnetic field lines they are not only equal to the current okay but they are also having a contribution coming from the displacement charge density okay so this is how the modification in blue they are showing the modifications that have taken place okay in the dynamic case in the differential form this is how the differential equations look like so these are all based on there are two divergence and two curl equations as we have seen so divergence of d is rho v that remains same for the um, time varying or the dynamic field as well curl of e is zero but curl of e in dynamic uh, electromagnetic theory is minus dot b dot t divergence of b is zero that remains same but curl of h was only j according to ampere but then maxwell added this new term which is dot d by dot t okay and that completes the electromagnetic theory so this four equations are popularly known as the maxwell's equation and they can actually uh, describe the phenomena of electric field and the magnetic field that is varying in time and space okay so with that we'll stop here today and in the next lecture we'll cover the wave equation and the boundary um, conditions that we could not cover in this particular lecture thank you so anything um, any queries any doubts you have you can email to me that should thank you mm -hmm.